Hi, welcome to Distinta University course on engineering Q-vectors. In this uh, installment, we'll talk about coordinate systems. Uh, this part can be skipped by engineers and mathematicians and physicists, um, though you probably want, may want to stick around just for a refresher. The last time we learned that vectors represent a magnitude and direction. And we represent that magnitude and direction with an arrow where the length of the arrow is the magnitude and the direction that the arrow points is the direction. Now there are, very, there are many different ways to represent a magnitude and direction. In other words, we can, we can, we can parameterize the way that arrow points in many different ways. We have uh, two, two kinds of polar, polar coordinate systems. One is the one that navigation systems use, the other one we engineers use. There's a rectangular, and rectangular is really just the two-dimensional version of Cartesian coordinates. And then there's Cartesian coordinates, and these can go f uh, pretty much any number of dimension, even fractional dimensions. And then we have spherical coordinate systems and cylindrical uh, coordinate systems. Again, these are all called coordinate systems because it's how you describe the magnitude and direction of a vector. Now, what we showed in the last video is how navig navigation systems use uh, vectors. But they describe their direction is a heading which is relative to north and the angles in degrees increment going clockwise such that east is 90 degrees, south is 180 degrees, west is 270 degrees. For example, if a ship is leaving port, they may take a heading of 53 degrees for 25 miles and then a heading of 0 degrees for 15 miles. Now, you say, well, why would they do that? Why wouldn't they just take a straight path? Well, it could be that there's an island in the middle you know, that they're on the port of an island and they have to get out around the island to get to place where the treasure is. And that would be the reason why they would take a dog leg. That's called a dog leg like that. Uh, and this will be the last time we discuss navigation type polar. The reason why I brought this forward is to show you that what engineers use evolved from this. Uh, and the reason why this is called polar is because the angle of direction is relative to the North Pole. Okay, and but in engineering we use the same term polar, but there's no North Pole. We instead have the same idea, except that our angles start from the x-axis, and the angles are measured from the x-axis. Therefore, 90 degrees is, is uh, in the y direction. 180 degrees is in the minus x direction. 270 degrees is in the minus y direction. And 0 degrees is in the x direction. And we could represent the same vectors. Okay. Um, and, and the other thing is, is that these angles increase counterclockwise. And for engineering polar, we have two coordinates. We have r, which is the, the, the magnitude of the vector, and theta, which is the direction. There's your magnitude and direction. And we typically rent, represent a vector as r angle theta when we use engineering polar. This is the shorthand for a magnitude at a direction. And we represent vectors as variables that are uppercase. And it doesn't have to be one character. We can use multiple characters. But for the sake of this course, we're going to use single letter vector uh, lab labels to represent vectors. Okay, so that's engineering polar. And there's a, there's a transformation to go from polar to rectangular. Okay, in rectangular coordinates, instead of using an angle and a direction, we treat each vector as how many uh, degree or how many uh, inches in x direction and how many inches in length in the y direction in order to get the direction and magnitude of each vector, and we represent that as 20 in x and 15 in y. That would be the same. That would be the same as a 38, 36.87, or 25 at 36.87 degrees. So we can go between polar and rectangular coordinate systems and we would calculate in order to go from polar to rectangular okay this is where you need to know your sine and cosine where the distance in the y direction would be r times the sine of theta and the distance in the x direction we are cosine theta and that's how we can convert from polar to rectangular 
and to go from rectangular back to polar, theta would equal the arctan 2 of uh, the y component 15 over 20. Now it depends because if you use Excel these are the other way around. Actually that's just arctan. There's also a function arctan 2 where you put in the y and then the x component and that would get you the angle theta here which would be th so many degrees. And if you use Excel spreadsheets these are backwards. They want you to put the x and then the y so don't get confused and Excel is going to give you the angle in radians not degrees. We're talking about all degrees here. Uh, radian is a different form of angle measurement. Um, I would hope that you're familiar with that because the requirement is at least high school geometry and trigonometry where you should be familiar with the different types of angles. And you should also be familiar with sines and cosines. So anyway, that's the conversion between engineering polar and engineering rectangular. Uh, and basically we're doing the exact same thing here, the same uh, direction and distance to the final resultant vector, C. C is equal to A plus B. We'll talk about vector addition in a few minutes, but that would be what we're showing here is addition of two vectors to get a final vector C, but we'll talk about that later. Then there's also cylindrical coordinates. Now these get a little more complicated. The rest, the ones I showed you before are two-dimensional. Okay, but now if you want to represent points in three-dimensional space, we have to, we add another dimension to the polar coordinates called Z. Okay, so we in, it normally, so like the polar coordinates, we represent a vector R and theta in the XY plane, but then to get Z, we just take that point and move it up by Z. Now the reason why these are called uh, cylindrical coordinates because if you hold R the same and you adjust Z and theta you'll end up spinning out a cylinder. Let me show you that in a picture. Here's Z, here's Y, and here's X. Well if I keep Z at zero and I spin R and Y I'm gonna have a circle, uh, I'm sorry, spin theta, I'm gonna have a circle in the XY plane. If I increment Z I'm gonna have another circle a little bit above that. Increment Z again, I'm going to have another circle a little bit above that, and again, and again, and again. And so we'll end up tracing out a cylinder. That's why these are called cylindrical coordinates. We're not going to discuss much of these in this course. I'm just trying to give you a flavor for what cylindrical coordinates are, because in certain cases these are easier to use than the ones we're going to be using, but it depends on, on the case. Then there's also spherical coordinates. And the same kind of idea is that you have this uh, construction line that, that moves in the XY plane and its offset is theta, but instead of, of moving up by Z, instead the vector then goes off the perpendicular by a theta. So basically R starts at zero, then you move it in the, toward Y in, in phi, er, theta, and then you move it up in elevation by phi to get the point you're trying to point at in space. The way you can imagine that is uh, a dome of an observatory, whereas the rotation of the dome on the base would be your theta angle, and how far up the telescope is off the horizontal, that would be your phi. And that's why you could take this very confusing diagram and visualize it a little more concretely in what we're talking about. And the coordinates are r, theta, and phi represent a direction of Theta and phi represent the direction, r represents the magnitude. Uh, lastly, there's Cartesian coordinates in three space. And same thing as the polar coordinates, we have an x component, a y component, all we do then is just add a z coordinate. So it's very simple as far as conceptually conceptualizing, a, uh, locating a point in three dimensional space. And in fact, polar coordinates are just a two dimensional version of Cartesian coordinates. They're both of the, of the class Cartesian coordinates. It's just rectangular core. I'm sorry, if I said polar, I meant rectangular. So the rectangular coordinates are the two dimensional version of Cartesian coordinates. We just call them rectangular to, you know, to kind of tell people we're going to be using a two dimensional modeling as opposed to Cartesian, which is typically three space and above. Okay, there's many other coordinate systems out there. The ones shown that I just showed you are the most generally used. The choice of which system to use depends on what makes analysis easier or which more closely mimics the phenomenon being modeled. Like for example, 
if you've got it pointing a telescope, you're definitely going to want to use the spherical coordinates. That's a lot easier to visualize than it is trying to use Cartesian coordinates to point your telescope. Okay, and, to, and again, a, a, a vector is a magnitude and direction. And sometimes we like to break that up. Sometimes we want to know just what the magnitude of a vector is so we can use it in an equation that is not a vector equation. And sometimes we just want a direction of a vector because we want to make another vector parallel to it. Okay, and we represent the magnitude of vector A with A inside um, these vertical brackets. That means when you show that, means you, that, is, that symbol represents the magnitude of A without the direction. So that's just the length of the arrow. It doesn't matter what direction the arrow is pointing in. Okay, the direction of A is represented by A with this little carrot, I guess it's called, on the top. Kind of like a little pointer. And basically the direction of A is what you're saying is I don't, care, I don't care about the magnitude, I just want the direction of A. So that's how we can split apart a vector into a component part. You multiply these together, you multiply the magnitude times direction, you get back to your original vector. So this is how we can break up a vector into its component parts because sometimes we need to know those for other things. Okay, and the way you can visualize magnitude and direction Okay, the magnitude of a vector would be the length of the vector. The direction vector would be a unit vector, a vector of length 1 in the same direction as the vector you're trying to model. Okay, so this would be the, the, the direction of A and this would be the magnitude of A. Therefore, if you multiply this unit vector times the magnitude of A, you get back to A. Okay, in a spherical coordinate system, same thing, a, your, your magnitude is still is going to be R and your direction vector is going to be 1 at angle theta phi. So it's a unit vector in the direction that your vector A is pointing in. Okay, again, this is magnitude and direction. We're breaking a vector up in its two component parts because sometimes that helps us to know that. And for all the different coordinate systems, I'm not going to go into this in depth, but this is how you compute the magnitude for all the different coordinate systems. The polar and spherical, real easy, you just take the value R, that's the magnitude. Okay, for the Cartesian coordinate systems, which is rectangular and Cartesian, you just got to do the uh, Pythagorean theorem to get the magnitude. Cylindrical, it's Pythagorean theorem again, but it's R and Z. And granted, and granted, there's other systems out there, and each one has a different way of computing magnitude. And the way we can find direction once you know magnitude is you just take, since a vector is a magnitude times direction, all you have to do then is divide both sides of this equation by magnitude, and then you can get your direction is your vector divided by its magnitude. That's the simple way to do it. And for I'm just going to show you Cartesian coordinates. You have your vector A, which is AX plus AY plus AZ. This means the X component of A, the Y component of A, and the Z component of A. That, that's what that notation means. These aren't two variables. These are just one variable with two letters representing the, the variable. Okay, and then we can find the magnitude of A by squaring and taking the square root squaring and summing and then taking the square root of all those. And then if we take A and divide it by the magnitude of A, well we get the the magnitude of A in the, the take the component of A in the X direction divided by the magnitude plus the, cor the component of A in the Y direction divided by the blah 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 blah. Go on and on and on. So, so this would be the direction vector. It looks very confusing but all this higher order math that we're doing is just simple multiplication, division, addition, and subtraction, just a lot more of it. Okay, And so this is how we can find the direction in Cartesian coordinates, where, like I showed you before, in the polar coordinates, it's actually quite easy. Your, your direction vector in polar coordinates is just r, theta, phi. Now people would say, well, if it's a little bit simpler to use polar coordinates, why don't we use, I'm sorry, so spherical coordinates, why don't we use spherical coordinates? Because spherical coordinates are pretty much limited to three space systems, whereas Cartesian coordinates you can do anything. And you can't really add vectors too easily in polar space. You, typically when we do polar or rectangle, uh, sorry, polar or spherical modeling, in order to add vectors we have to convert them into Cartesian coordinates before we can add them. So adding vectors in Cartesian coordinates is easy. So, but we're not going to cover that stuff anymore. So again, your direction vector is the little vector of unit length in the direction of A. And 
because it's a unit vector, it has a magnitude. If you take the magnitude of the direction vector, you're going to get the value 1, because the length of a direction vector is always 1. And some people like to call direction vectors unit vectors. That's fine. That's what they're also called. Uh, some people even combine them together, say a unit direction vector. All those are valid. Again, a direction vector or a unit vector or a unit direction vector, they're all the same thing. They're just a vector of length 1 that's in the direction of your vector. So the direction of A is a unit vector in the direction of A. And I guess these are the ways that you can get the direction vectors in all the different systems. Uh, I already covered the Cartesian, which includes rectangular. Uh, you can look at these on your own. Uh, again, you see how simpler it is to get a unit direction vector in spherical coordinates. But when you try to go add vectors in spherical coordinates, it becomes a pain in the neck. So the remainder of this course, we're going to focus on Cartesian coordinates that include rectangular. Uh, the reason why is because Cartesian coordinates have pretty much universal application. And Cartesian coordinates can go to virtually unlimited dimensions. And subtraction and addition of vectors is, tri is a trivial thing. Now, I have a correction to the previous video. In the list of things that I, representing what vectors can represent, I had this, and I accidentally had speed here. This should have been velocity. Speed is the magnitude of velocity. So if you have velocity, and you take the magnitude of velocity, that equals speed. So this should have been velocity. Sorry about that. So recap. We discussed the coordinate systems to give you a familiarization that there's a lot of different ways to represent a vector. And we went over polar, rectangular, Cartesian, spherical, cylindrical. There are many others. Each has its benefits for any given particular application. We discussed magnitude, and we discussed direction vectors, which are also known as unit vectors. Uh, and that's pretty much it. Thank you. This completes the section on engineering Q vectors coordinate systems. Thank you.